Hey, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to thank you for checking out our messages online and wanted to encourage you. I pray that your soul is nourished through the hearing of the word. But at the same time, the writer of Hebrews is very clear about uh, not giving up meeting together. Don't give up the larger gathering. As a matter of fact, in the book of Acts, the early church made it a point to meet together almost daily even, breaking bread together, encouraging one another, being in communion with one another to build each other up. And, and that is vitally important to your spiritual walk. So I pray that you enjoy this message. But at the same time, I pray that you find a great church body to be a part of, whether that be here at the bridge or somewhere else, so that you can be built up as well. Thank you and God bless. Today we're in week four of this series on the book of James. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab them out now. Um, this morning we're going to be in James chapter two, okay? James chapter two. If you don't have a Bible with you or you don't have an app for that, okay, I'd encourage you to grab one of those black Bibles from the chair racks in front of you. Um, here at the bridge, we make it a point not to put the scripture passage on the screen because we want to make sure we're doing all we can to help you get in the word each and every day, including Sunday mornings, all right? So uh, uh, if, you've got, if you don't know how to get there, let me help you find it, okay? Go to the back. Go to the back. The book of James is near the very back. It's just after the book of Hebrews and uh, just before the books or the letters from Peter, first and second Peter, okay? So, uh, uh, and then there, I've checked every Bible on the continent. If you have troubles finding it, there's this thing that has a table of contents and I've confirmed it personally that every single one has one of these and you should be able to use that to help you find the, the book of James, all right? So, once again, uh, we call it a book, but really what we're gonna be studying this morning and what we've been studying for the last three weeks is a letter. It's a letter written by a guy named James who was Jesus' little brother. That's right, Mary and Joseph had kids after Jesus, okay? And uh, uh, he wrote this letter, he's a pastor during this time, and he wrote this letter around the, 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 the years 47 or 49 AD, it's estimated, and he wrote these letters to a bunch of Christians that were under persecution, <laughs> Okay? He wrote them to a bunch of churches and Christians and people that were under persecution for their faith. We in North America don't really understand persecution because we have freedom of religion, but during that time, the church was so persecuted, as a matter of fact, that they, had, they were splintered and broken and meeting in homes because they couldn't meet publicly. They would be tried, they would be unjustly uh, 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 crucified in a lot of cases and, and persecuted, and so they met in homes, and, and what's unique about Let James's letter is that in the midst of all these trials, in the midst of all these perse this persecution, James's very first words to them are, consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy when you experience trials of many kinds. That's James's encouragement for them. And, and, and really what he's trying to say and what he continues to say all throughout the letter and what he tries to encourage these people to do is hold fast to their faith and let faith work itself out in them. Hold fast to your faith and let your faith work itself out in you. See, what James understood was, was that faith under pressure is like gold in the fire. Faith under pressure is like gold in the fire. The hotter the oven gets, the more pure the, the gold becomes and the more the impurities are raised to the top. And this morning, I feel led, to, led excuse me, I feel led, I feel led to reiterate something to you that I said last week to our people. I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know your whole story. I know a lot of you pretty well, but um, many of you this morning, I don't know you as well as I wish I could. And I don't think it's possible for me to get to know every single person in this room. Um, I don't know where you're from. I, I see new faces this morning. We're so glad you're here. I, I, I don't know what you're going through. I don't, I don't know what, what's been done to you or what you've done, but, but I feel like God wants to help you realize something. I feel like this morning, uh, 
God wants you to know that he's there. I feel like this morning that no matter what trial you're going through, no matter what thing you're dealing with, no matter what mountain you're trying to climb, God is present. He may not seem like it, you may not sense it, you may not feel like he even exists, but he does, and most importantly, he loves you. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. And you need to know that. And, and, and what God's telling you this morning as you wrestle through trials and temptations and struggles is that God sees you and what he's asking from you is that, that you see a different perspective in your situation. And, and, and I feel led this morning to say maybe it's time to stop asking God why and rather it's time for you to start asking what. What Lord are you trying to teach me? What, Lord, do I need to see in this trial? What, Lord, am I supposed to learn in this? How are you trying to work out my faith through this? Today, I want to I start this morning um, by having us imagine something. I know last week I had you close your eyes and bow your heads. But this morning, I, I want you to imagine something different. And you don't have to close your eyes and bow your heads again like we did last week. But, but I just want you to take a second and I want you to imagine a relationship, okay? Any relationship, okay? I want you to imagine a relationship where a man and a woman say that they're madly in love with each other and they decide to get married, okay? I want you to then imagine the wife coming to the decision after they have been married, coming to the decision that she doesn't want to move in with the man. She just comes to this decision. I, I don't really want to move into it with him. I just don't see any reason to. And then I want you to imagine the fact that she also makes this decision that she doesn't want to even consummate the marriage. She doesn't want there to be any physical intimacy in the relationship because you know what? Physical touch just makes her uncomfortable and she's just that type of person. Then I want you to imagine this woman deciding not to serve her husband even though he's humbled himself to her daily. I want you to imagine that she decides she's not going to submit to him even though he's submitted to her. I want you to imagine that she refuses to have children even though that's something that her husband deeply desires. She decides that it's just not necessary. She doesn't want her body to get ruined through, through, through pregnancy. There's a lot of work that comes with, with bearing children, and not only that, through raising them. And, 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 and quite honestly, she's just she's not, not, not willing to do that. I want you to imagine that she doesn't submit to her, 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 herself to her husband. She doesn't humble herself to her husband. I, I want you to imagine that she, she does almost nothing to show that she is married to this man, but she insists over and over and over again that she is married to him and that she loves him. As you imagine that, as I imagine that, it, it sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? Like it just sounds crazy. Like that's insane. Why, why would you even get married if that was the case? Like what was the point? What did you accomplish? What, what, what are you doing? What are you accomplishing by getting married? In what realm has that, is that woman truly seen as married to that man? I mean, it's just crazy. And if that doesn't sound crazy to you, I'm sorry, but you're crazy, all right? I love you. If you're new with us, I'm glad you're here, okay? But you're out of your mind if you don't think that that's nuts. Today I want to talk to you about something that is so absolutely prevalent in our American culture, but also in our Christian culture as well. Today we're going to tackle the issue, this issue in James's letter that's pretty well known, but very rarely owned up to. We're going to talk about this issue that's pretty well known, but very rarely owned up to. Last week we talked about this a little bit. We kind of hinted at it. But we didn't really hammer it down. And today, as we step into James chapter 2, um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the correlation between faith and works. We're going to talk about the correlation between our faith and our works. The Bible, maybe you didn't know this, the Bible describes our relationship with our Heavenly Father. The, 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 the Bible describes our relationship with Jesus like He is the groom and we are the bride. It describes us like he is the groom and we are the bride. And faith without works is like that marriage we just imagined. 
faith without works looks like that. It's ludicrous. It's crazy. Makes no sense, does it? Having faith without works is like buying a Ferrari and never driving it. Faith without works is, is like sitting on a bike and never pedaling it. That's what we said last week, right? It's like saying you love to cook, but you never turn on the stove. It's like saying you trust someone with your kids, but you never let them leave your sight. It's like getting on the plane and never leaving the ground. It's like saying you're a hard worker and never lifting a finger. Jesus said it's like a tree that bears no fruit. Or worse yet, it's like a tree that bears bad fruit. That's faith without works. If I'm honest with you, the Bible says over and over and over and over again that faith like that is worthless. It's worthless. And as we're about to find out, it's a faith that is dead. That's what James hinted at in chapter 1, and as we enter into chapter 2, we see him not just hint at it, but we see him hammer on it. Hopefully you've made it to chapter 2 no, two by now. Like I said earlier, or like I've said all throughout the series, as we work through the book of James, we're not going to be able to hit every single inch of it, but we're going to do our best to hit the big stuff. So as we come into chapter 2, we're going to skip all the way to verse 14 and see what James has to say about faith and works and the importance of of the two working together. Starting in verse 14, it says this. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and, and, and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing with their physical needs, what good is it? Like if someone comes to you in need and you have the ways to help them, resources to help them, and you do nothing, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied, that, that is not accompanied by action is dead. It's what? Dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Do you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. Talk about a punch in the gut. Well, I believe in Jesus. Good. So do the demons. Congratulations. You've gotten really far. They believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his own son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute, a prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. The Greek word here that's used in this letter for the word dead is the word nekras. Okay, if I can get this baby to work. Let me see if I can get it going here. Go to the next slide there, guys, will you? The, 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 word, the Greek word here for the word dead is the word nekras, okay? Can we say that together? Nekras, okay? Uh, literally translated into the English, this word is dead. That's what it means. The, de the word for dead in Greek means dead. It's very clear. It's very concise. It's very blunt. It's not tricky. And it's as though James is being blunt for, a very, for that very reason. This Greek word means dead. When your faith is not active, when it's not causing you to do anything, when it's not bringing about life and change and transformation, when it's lifeless, it is dead. I love how Mark Driscoll, a pastor in, Mark, in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, said, talked about this passage. He said, he, he said, you know what dead people do? Nothing. 
You know what dead people do? They do nothing. It's not a trick question. They, they do nothing. You know what dead faith does? Nothing. Dead faith is all lip service and no lifestyle. It's all lip service and no lifestyle. And this morning, as blunt as James is being and as blunt as Pastor Mark was just now, I feel led to be blunt with you today. If this is your first Sunday at the bridge, you need to know that I'm usually not this harsh, but every now and then I feel like God just, just presses in on me to press in on you, just as he's pressing in on me, okay? And um, we're really glad you're here, but, but maybe you're here for that exact reason. Maybe the reason I, I feel like God's leading me to be blunt this morning is because he wanted to speak to you this morning. Um, and, and he knew that, that this was the only way that, that he was going to get through to you if, if someone was willing to be blunt and straightforward and maybe even a little harsh as I lean into you this morning because he knew that that was going to be the only way that you heard what he was trying to say. You picked a good morning. That's what I'm trying to say. Buckle up. All right? You picked a good morning. Now let me be blunt. Many of you have a faith this morning that is worthless. You have a faith that is useless. Many of you have a faith this morning that is absolutely dead. I don't say that to judge you or condemn you. I say that to warn you. I say that because I love you. I say that because Jesus said in the book of Revelation to a church that was lukewarm, he said, you disgust me. I say that because there's a God in heaven that loves you and wants you to come to life. Your faith is dead. It's doing nothing. It's pushing you into nothing. You say you believe in the Father and that you believe in Jesus Christ, but you are doing nothing to live that out or show it. You say, I, I believe in Jesus, congratulations. Even the demons believe that. You're not growing. You're, not, you're full of words and you're full of excuses for this faith that you're trying to prove that's alive that's not because it has no evidence whatsoever. You're not growing. You're not giving. You're not serving. You're not surrendering. You're not submitting to God's word or the spiritual leadership of the church. Some of you have been doing this for years and you think everything's good and it's not. Some of you are living out a faith that is dead. How much irony is there in that statement? You are living out of faith that is dead. You've allowed the enemy to fool you and you've allowed him to harden your heart to this idea and you're not only that, you're fooling yourself. You've turned Jesus into a life coach instead of a master. You want the savior side of Christianity and none of the submission. The reality is that for many of you, if Jesus wasn't a part of your life, your life wouldn't look any different anyways. That's a problem, isn't it? Like if I remove Jesus out of my life, I should be a completely different person. And vice versa. And you wouldn't act any different because you were never submitting to him in the first place. You were never working out your faith in the first place. There's never been any life change, if you're honest. You just come to service on Sunday morning, you get your, your Jesus fix, and you go back on with your old life. You don't come to church, or excuse me, you might come to church, but you don't like being the church because that means sacrifice and self-denial and work, and those are all foreign concepts to you. You think Jesus came for you and you alone and no one else. Some of you might be getting upset with me right now, and I would encourage you, I've said this through a number of sermons, you might be getting upset with me right now, but I, I need you to know, I'm talking to a group of people. 
So if you're feeling convicted right now, you, you, you don't get to get mad at me. It's, it's your turn to get mad at the Holy Spirit because he's the one leaning in on you, not me. Like I said earlier, I don't know, I don't know you as well as I'd like to. Many of you, I don't know what struggles you're dealing with, what your heart's wrestling with, what you're, what you're fighting against, what you're, you're dealing with, what your trials and temptations are. But God does. And he also knows those of you in this room that are lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. You say you believe, but there's no evidence. There's nothing that follows that. Up. The Holy Spirit is leaning in on you. And as much as it's easy for you to get angry, I would encourage you to go back to James chapter 1 where he says, speak less and listen more. It's hard to receive wisdom when you don't know how to shut up. <laughs> That's what I said last week. God's trying to speak to you. He's trying to get you to listen. And, and, and for many of us, we, we sit there and we come up with excuses. We're, Lord, I'm not doing this because of this and I'm not doing this because of that. And I, and I just wonder, I, I love God. I think he's ever patient, ever kind, ever loving. And he'll never stop doing that to us. But I wonder how often he just gets exhausted with the excuses. When are you going to give it all to me? Like I gave it all for you. Sometimes I wonder, if that's what God's saying. He's saying, stop with the words, the endless words, the endless excuses. Speak less, listen more, be slow to anger, receive the wisdom I'm trying to, 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 to give to you. He, in this trial, in this temptation, in this time where you are lukewarm, come alive. The book of Proverbs says this, it says, sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. Other translations say, hold your tongue or restrain your tongue. To do those things is to be wise. Speak less, listen more, let God work in and through you and respond. Stop leaving service on Sunday morning just convicted. Go do something about it, amen? Be convicted to action. Be convicted to life change. Be convicted to live out this faith that Jesus Christ gave everything for. While some of us might be upset, a few other, other, others of us might be confused. Well, Pastor Rob, I, I remember this one passage in the Bible where, where you know, I, it says that we're saved by grace through faith, not works. Like I, and, and, and we hold on to that passage, right? Like that's our passage. That's where we find our security. We take it and we wrap it up and we, we hold it and we put it under our pillow. And anytime we start to, to doubt or we start to, to make excuses, we pull that out and we say, hey, I'm saved by grace through faith and that's where I get my security and I'm always gonna hold on to that. That passage is found in the book of Ephesians through a man named Paul. It's a letter from a man named Paul. He's preaching to a church in Ephesus and it says, for it is by grace... You have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And, and, and we read that passage, and then we go, well, well, how are we supposed to reconcile that, Rob? And as we reread our passage in James, we, we, we get confused and we go, what's James getting at? And doesn't this mean the Bible's contradicting itself? If we're saved by grace through faith and not works, why is James saying we don't have a faith if we don't have works? Well, we have to consider a couple of things. First of all, what Paul said in uh, the book of Ephesians uh, has to do with him addressing a different church, a different issue, in a different context. Paul's talking to a different group of people. What's going on in the, in the church of Ephesus at this time is there's a group of people called Judaizers. Can we just say that word together? Judaizers. Judaizers were people during uh, the early church that tried to mix Christianity and Judaism and put them together. They tried to get Christians to submit to the old law, which is now fulfilled in Christ when we're trying to, and trying to just follow the new law, which is in Christ, Amen. And, and what these Judaizers are doing is specifically they're trying to get Gentiles, okay, people, these Judaizers are former Jews trying to be Christians, but they're trying to mix the two, and you can't do that. And they're trying to get these Gentiles, these people that are new Christians that aren't Jews, to be circumcised. Because during that time in the Old Testament, to be circumcised meant that you were set apart. 
It meant that that, that that was God's covenant with Abraham in the beginning and, and every Jew thereafter was circumcised if they were born, Jewish male, excuse me, and, and, and that was the sign that they were set apart for God's people. And when Christ came, what Paul says in Ephesians is the only thing that matters is circumcision of the heart. That's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing God's paying attention to. We're not following that old covenant anymore. That was for Israel. That's not for us. We are under the new law. We are under Christ's law. We live in a different way. We have a different relationship. It's completely different. Paul's addressing a different church, a different issue, and a different context. And what Paul's saying is, God only cares about circumcision of the heart and evidence of that circumcision is life transformation. Evidence of that circumcision is life transformation, which brings us to the second thing that we have to consider and understand, and that is that James doesn't discredit Paul's statement. He affirms it. James's statement, it's missing a word there, James's statement doesn't discredit Paul's statement. It affirms it. What do you mean by that? Well, let's go back to our imaginary marriage that we started with. Or better yet, let's, let's talk about my marriage, okay? We'll talk about my marriage. And you can answer, I'm not asking you a rhetorical question here, so I'm looking for some feedback. Am I married, Rob Williams, am I married because I live with my wife? No. Am I married because uh, I, I have sexual intimacy with my wife? No. Some of you guys are like, we don't want to talk about that, Rob. Any, am I married because I help out around the house and share a bank account with her and sleep in the same, be same bed as her? No. no. Those things don't make me married to her. What I do does not make me married. But if I said I was married and didn't do any of those things, y'all would think I was crazy. If I was married and I didn't do any of those things at all whatsoever, you'd be like, Rob has a problem. We got to go get him to a psychiatrist. Like, we got to figure out what's going on. Now, a lot of people do all those things when they are married, but that doesn't make them married, okay? And I'm not, like, like we understand that as well. And actually, that explores the other side of the coin that we're not going to talk about today. But I think one commentary nails it on the head when they talk about this passage. They say, no one can be saved by works, but then no one can be saved without producing works. We're not saved by our works, but we are saved for good works, James's point was not that works must be added to faith, but that genuine faith includes works, which brings a clear Christian, Christian perspective that Paul and James paint together, okay? They are working in unison with one another because the clear Christian perspective says that I am not defined by what I do, but I do because of who I am. I am not defined by what I do, but I do because I am. I am a child of God, not a slave of the world. And because of I am a child of, the, of God, this is who I am and this is what I do. I've used this illustration before. If I told you that this chair could hold you up, if you'd never seen that chair before, and I brought it out, I said, check out this chair. It's the best chair in the whole world. It's the most sturdy chair in the whole world, but don't sit in it. Don't sit in it. And, and, and then you say, well, can you sit in it? And I'm like, no, I'm not sitting in it. Are you crazy? Like, you wouldn't believe me. You wouldn't believe me that I had faith in that chair. It's the same thing with God. If you're not going to live out your faith, if you're not going to prove it through your actions, if you're not sitting on the foundation that is Jesus Christ and living it out with your life, then no one's going to believe you. And most importantly, here's the crazy thing. God's not going to believe you. And someday when you see him face to face, he's going to go, I don't believe you. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know you. If I say this, this chair can hold me up, but then refused to sit in it, it would be hard to believe that I believed, that I believed that chair could actually hold me up. 
And my question to you this morning is whether or not you actually believe in a faith that can hold you up. And are you living that out through your life and your actions? Do your actions affirm who you are? This example James uses here is perfect. He writes in verse 17, excuse me, verse 15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? You know what I think the Christian equivalent of that is today? How many of you are on social media? Raise your hands. How many of you are on social media? Raise your hands. Okay. All right. I think the equivalent of that is when somebody posts something on Facebook that's tough or a tragedy or a hard thing that they're going through or, or some help that they need, worse yet, and we just respond with, oh, thoughts and prayers, and we do nothing else to help them. Or we say thoughts and prayers, and we don't actually pray for them. I think that's the Christian equivalent. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think thoughts and prayers are important. As a matter of fact, I think we should be doing them. I think we should constantly do everything we can to have our thoughts not centered on us, but on Christ and those around us. That we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. That we do everything we can to be that for someone. But are we actually being it? Are we actually doing it? Sometimes, sometimes I even wonder how many times I've said that to somebody. I've said that to somebody. And I'm the answer to that prayer. Because Sometimes we are the answers to our very own prayers. Like, Lord, please provide a way for that struggling family or that struggling single mom to get some food. And God's going, I got the food. It's in your cupboard. Lord, help this family that's, you know, come upon some tough times. They, they need clothes for the new school year for their children. And, and, and I just don't know where they're going to get it. Lord, please just provide it for them. I did. They're in your closet. You remember that last time when you were looking to pick out an outfit and you had to like shove the hangers over, but like you couldn't shove them over because you had so many clothes? They're in your closet. Lord, help this family, you know, come up with some money to catch up on their bills. Jimmy just lost his job and they could, they could really use some help. And God's going, I did, it's in your bank account. I've got that money, it's in your wallet. Now here's the thing. I think, I think for many of us, when we think about being the answer to someone's prayers, the bad tendency would be to let that weigh down on us. Like, how can I do that? Like, I got, they make, like, you think about the fact that you're called to be the answer to someone's prayer, and it's easy for you to go, man, that, that puts the weight of the world on my shoulders. But, but I would challenge you once again, as, as we've been saying almost every week, to change your perspective. Because how cool is it that you get to be the answer to somebody's prayer? How cool is it that you are plan A? How awesome is it that you have the opportunity to bless somebody and be the answer to their prayer? Or better yet, be the answer to your very own. Like, that's, that's the kind of Christian life I want to live. I want to be excited about the fact that I get to be the answer to somebody's prayer. I get to be the one to help them. I get to be the one to serve them. I get to be the one to be Jesus Christ to them. That, to me, is, is as cool as it gets. So here's some questions for you to wrestle with today. And I, I don't have these all written down. I would encourage you to write these down. Um, I didn't put them in the, the uh, handout, but I just want us to, to take a personal inventory this week, okay? Maybe you do this as you go home. Maybe you talk to your spouse about it on the car ride home. Maybe you talk to, us, to some, uh, with some close friends as you're on your way home. But I want you to wrestle with all of these different questions, okay? First off, maybe flip your handout over and you can write it on the back. Um, but first, I, I want you to... Take some time and I want you to celebrate what you're doing. 
Like, we're not trying to be like, like down and depressed here. Like, what work am I doing that God's called me to? Like, let's celebrate that. Let's, okay, I've been obedient here. I know we've been doing this. I know we've been working on that, right? But then, I do want you to go to the other side. What work am I not doing? Where am I not stepping up? What, what is that thing that God's been telling me and convicting me that I'm supposed to be doing and, and I've been either making, I've ignored it so much that it's become white noise or he just told me about it and, and I, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with it. Where, what work am I not doing? Here at the bridge, we, uh, we submit to five faith commitments. If you want to become a member of our church, we talk about um, five faith, faith commitments. And you don't have to become a member, that's fine. But when you step into membership, it's about saying, hey, this isn't just my church anymore, this is my ministry now. And not only do I want to, to officially be a part of this family, but I want to be held accountable for my faith. I want my brothers and sisters in Christ to say, hey, I saw you were doing this and, and, and dude, I just want to hold you accountable. We got to talk about this because this is unhealthy. This isn't good for you. It's like, it, we, I tell people all the time, one of our, our biggest wins at the bridge is membership. Because that's where we get to hold people accountable to the, what the early church submitted to. Because in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes down upon the apostles and, and crazy things start to happen. They start speaking in different languages and tongues. And, 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 and then this guy, Peter, preaches this amazing message where thousands of people come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. And immediately after, we see this model of what the early church is supposed to look like and what really our church is supposed to look like. Look what it says in verse 42. Chap chapter 2, verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. In other words, to the word and to each other. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They didn't just give of their wealth. They sacrificed stuff so that they could serve their brothers and sisters. They sold property and possessions. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Not every Sunday, every day. They met together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. That's a beautiful picture of the church, isn't it? Like, what would, what would the bridge church look like if we did that every day? If we lived out our faith like that every day, if we served each other in this community like that every single day? i tell you one thing. It'd be hard to ignore the bridge church if you ever came to Charles City. And not only that, it would... It would allow us to see numbers added to our family daily. If we lived like that. So going back to those five faith commitments, along the lines of Acts 2, 42 through 47, we see those people worshiping, we see them growing, we see them serving, we see them giving, and we see them multiplying. Those are the five things that we hold to here at the bridge. And maybe you need to write those down. Let me say them again. Worship, are you worshiping on Sunday morning? Are you worshiping with your life? Are you worshiping with everything that you have? It's not just about, about being a seat warmer on Sunday. It's about worshiping God with all you got. Worship is to ascribe worth to something. Many of us have the wrong perspective when we come into worship. We think that worship is so that we can be filled, but really, it's about ascribing worth to our Father, amen? So we worship, grow. Are you growing spiritually? Are you getting into the Word every day? Are you praying? Do you have a real relationship with God? Something we say a lot here at the bridge is, are you growing at a deeper level than Sunday morning? Are you in a life group? Are you in a life group? Somebody asked me today, said, you gotta, you gotta be a member to be a life, in a life group, don't you? No, you don't. We just want you in community, healthy community where you can be held accountable to grow spiritually. Are you serving? Is this world all about you getting served or being served or you having the opportunity to serve? I always talk about you should always and forevermore be serving your faith, your family, and your community. Serving your church, family, community, faith, family, community. Where are you not serving? Giving. Do you give anything? Every Sunday for the last month and a half, we've said that tithes and offerings are a spiritual act of worship that is commanded by God. 
Are you giving to the church? Are you living generously with your lifestyle? Do people in this town know you as a very generous person? And are you multiplying? Are you keeping your faith to yourself? Or are you sharing it with others? Who's your one? Who's that one person at work or that one person in your life that, that you are investing and inviting to church as much as you possibly can? That you're pouring into, that you're serving, that you're dropping everything for, that you're doing all you can to be the hands and feet of Jesus to them. What work am I doing? What work am I not doing? How about this? Am I even available to do the work? How many of us, especially if we have little kids, are so busy that we're not even available to be there for somebody? We've got this tournament, we got that practice, we got this rehearsal, we got, we got that one thing that we're doing, we got this other thing that we're doing, we've got this family event scheduled, we've got every weekend locked up for the next five months. We can't remember the last time we slowed down, let alone we're available for somebody to be served. What if, what if we just cleared one day every week out of our calendar where we're gonna say, you know what? We're gonna clear that day in our calendar every week to be available in case something comes up. To help that friend that's struggling, to help that person that needs to move, to help that person that, that needs just someone to talk to. Am I even available? And then we've got one more question that I want us to wrestle with just before we sing. And maybe even as we sing. Where can you be the answer to someone's prayer this week? Where can you be the answer to someone's prayer this week? I wonder how many times we've prayed and God said, no, actually you're the answer to that one. When are you gonna, when are you gonna take that fist and open it up and allow, and just be more giving of yourself? can you be the answer to someone's prayer this week? We're, we're about to transition into this song called Reckless Love. Um, and something that kind of crossed my heart and my mind this week was what Jesus did. Let me ask you, if, if Jesus was full of words but never actually died on the cross for our sins, would we believe in who he was? If his faith, if his belief in who God sent him and called him to be wasn't followed up with true sacrifice, I don't think we would have believed who he was. I don't think the, the church would have swept the globe over the last 2,000 years and saved millions of people's lives if Jesus hadn't actually done what he said he was going to do. Because what he did proved who he was. Amen? Not just the fact that he died on the cross, but the fact that he was resurrected three days later. What makes us think that people are going to believe we are who we say we are if we don't do what he calls us to do? That we might be little Christians, little Christ followers. That's what the word Christian means, is little Christ. If we aren't actually denying ourselves daily, that we might minister to others. Where can you be someone's answer to prayer this week? Where can you be someone's answer to prayer? Because of the reckless love that God came forth with for you. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you, to learn from you, to grow together, to be in community and family, Lord, the freedom that we have to worship with no persecution, Father. It's a foreign concept in America and to read the book of James as he spoke to a church that was being persecuted and it was splintered and fracturing and meeting in homes, Lord, that, to, to be able to encourage them to have genuine faith, considerate joy, and, and make sure that their works are still showing who they are. Father, I pray that for the Bridge Church. I pray that we would change our hearts and our minds, that we would, that yes, we would have thoughts and prayers for others. But we would also follow that up with actions and deeds.
God, you call us to a life transformed that we might see a world transformed. And so, Lord, I pray that we can submit to that. Father, we love you, and we pray that all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.